Hello again. Um, I'm back from Rattingen this evening and I'm going to read chapter one of And I Shall Be Healed. Here's the book. There I am at the bottom. Okay. Chapter one. Casualty clearing station number 39, Allonville, France, Christmas Eve, 1916. I have lost count of the number of letters I have written. Occasionally a renewed awareness overcomes me mid-sentence, leaving me uncertain whether this is my last letter or still the first. But the rhythm of the work keeps me writing, blurring the significance of the words until only the sense of loss remains. At this hour of the night, it is easy to see myself as Rackham might draw me, a thin frame stooped over a desk, all sharp angles and hard patience. An eternal scribe, folded into the kernel of a spinning world, endlessly writing endless letters to unknown mothers, each one less shocking but more deeply felt than the last. On nights such as these I struggle with the familiarity of my well-worn phrases, which every now and then swim up out of the gloom towards me. I am writing to express my regret, Line of duty, a courageous and honourable young man. Only the names change. Names. At the bottom of the letter I add my own, Reverend L. J. Ellis. The wet ink shines in the lamplight and gives me an unsettling sense of distance. This L. J. Ellis and his practice duties feel so unreal so remote from my sense of self that I sometimes catch myself wondering who he is. Straightening my back, I lay down my pen and push the folded paper briskly into the waiting envelope. It is tiredness, nothing more. Yet still the feeling holds me, and I cannot ignore my childish fear of the darkness that crouches beyond the pool of lamplight. Some might say that a clergyman should not believe in ghosts, but there are times when I feel surrounded by them. Somewhere beyond the gilded walls of this requisition chateau, a bell begins to ring. Ambulances are bringing in the wounded. I sit very still and listen. The corridors that must once have echoed with life now ring with the many sounds of pain and running feet. Still the bell rings. The operating rooms will be busy tonight, as they were last night, and will be tomorrow night, and the night after that, for ever and ever, my hour is yet to come. I pick up my pen and turn to another name, another muslin bag of belongings to be faithfully returned, accompanied by the cold comfort of my personal assurance of a young life lost bravely. The lamp flame flickers within its glass shell, and for a moment the shadows around me rear overhead like demons reaching for my soul. I still, breathless with fright, listening to my own heartbeat, my sudden shallow breathing. Beyond these small terrors, beyond the sound of the casualty clearing station bursting into life, there is another sound, a duller, slower sound, now so familiar that I find it almost comforting. The voice of the guns. From the wall above my desk, a middle-aged dowager gazes down at me out of a gilt frame. The haughtiness of her poise makes me smile. What would she think of me, sitting here in her grand house? Would she consider it a blot on her family name to shelter an ordained priest of the English church? I suspect that the fact my father is an innkeeper would bother her more. I look at her again. In the lamplight, the frame casts dark shadows across her face, as though she were veiled in mourning. Why is she still here? Her dress is old-fashioned, but not so old-fashioned. Is she already so short of descendants that her portrait is abandoned to the curious gaze of an army chaplain? The hall beyond this room is hung heavily with pale squares where paintings have been taken down and carried away. Yet she has been left behind. Poor lady. Perhaps she has no descendants. Or perhaps, having had them, she now finds herself surplus to requirements. 
Perhaps she is no mother anyone would wish to own. My eyes are fighting to close, but I work on until the darkness begins to lift. The dawn, when it comes, brings an explosion of birdsong to rattle my window, and I am held transfixed by the peace that only such a din can bring. For a moment I don't hear the knock at my door. Are you awake, Mr Ellis? The duty M.O. puts his head around the door. Of course you are. Come with me, quickly. Tell me. I follow the doctor into a corridor, lit, dimly lit by paraffin lamps, placed at intervals along the floor. He came in last night, abdominal injuries. We took him straight into surgery, did what we could, but I doubt he'll make it. Does he know? I have to hurry to keep up with Dr Owens, who marches firmly ahead, answering my questions over his shoulder. Yes, he asked for you. Owen stops suddenly outside the vast doors to what was once a ballroom, and his voice drops to a penetrating whisper. Number seven, I'll leave you to it. A lamp has been left by the soldier's bed. The card on the wall above the bed describes the occupant as a corporal in a London regiment. He is awake and turns his head at my approach. Good morning, corporal. How do you feel? I sit down in the chair beside the bed. I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt. He tries to smile. He wants to be brave, but I can see the pain and fear in his eyes. He is a young man. We are probably of an age. The observation catches me unawares. I am twenty-eight years old. When did I last feel young? I realise that he is waiting for me to speak, and so I ask him the first question that comes into my head. Are you married? The corporal shakes his head. Engaged. I asked Kate to marry me when I got my call up. He stirs, evidently in pain. I had a picture of her. It's here. His possessions are kept in the muslin bag hanging above the bed. He has few treasures. A box of matches, a shred of tobacco, an army paybook, and a tattered photograph of a pretty young woman. This I press into his anxious fingers. At the sight of that beloved face, the young man seems to relax. Tears start into his eyes. I wish we'd got married before I came over. He strokes the photographs fondly, and sighs or groans. I'm not sure which. But I wanted to distinguish myself, make her proud of me. He looks at me, his eyes are naturally bright. Do you understand, Mr Ellis? Yes, Corporal, I understand. The card on the wall offers me a prompt. You have distinguished yourself. I see you have a medal. DCM, the boy smiles. She can be proud of now. He is fading. I reach for my notebook. The young man dictates brief, loving messages for his fiancée and his mother. I button these precious last words back into my pocket, and then, taking the soldier's hand, whisper the prayer of commendation. By the time the last word is whispered, he is no longer conscious. I turn down the lamp, and as no one else calls to me at this early hour, I turn to my room, to the letters still waiting to be written. Dr. Owens meets me at breakfast less than four hours later. He is a dark, broad-shouldered Welshman, with a booming voice and a neat moustache. At our first meeting he was quite a talker, but the last few months have settled a certain silence upon him that only necessity can disturb. You look exhausted, Mr Ellis. He pulls out the chair for me at my approach. A long night, I agree, sitting down, taking a sip of lukewarm tea. How's our corporal? My answer is written on Owen's face. Died at seven o'clock this morning. I look at the food on my plate, food that I am too tired to eat. How many in total? Five. Two died in surgery, one in transit, plus two admitted last week. I'll bury them first thing, as soon as the graves are dug. My voice recites my day's schedule. The censor's office has got me for a couple of hours this afternoon. I'll sort out the effects and letters for the families this evening after the service. There is also the Christmas service and celebration for the CCS staff and such men who can leave their beds. Others I will visit individually. I must write to my wife. Owens heaves himself to his feet, his pipe already in his hand. Then it's bed for me. 
He yawns. A gold tooth catches the light before he covers his mouth with the back of his hand. Excuse me. I'd say you have an hour, maybe an hour and a half, before the ward round finishes. So if I were you, I'd go and get my head down for a while. Looking at you now, I doubt you'll last the day. Merry Christmas, Mr Ellis. He claps me on the shoulder as he walks away. Alone, my eyes begin to close and my head to nod. I hardly register the man who hands me a letter, but it wakes me up. Writing and receiving letters forms the staple of my employment, but for some reason the erratic handwriting on the envelope of this one makes my stomach churn. The handwriting or perhaps the postmark. It reminds me of another letter, received and read years ago but still impossible to forget. I slip it into my pocket and head back to my room. It can wait. A time to every purpose. Now there is too much to do. My desk welcomes me back. The waiting correspondent still stands in patient piles. I pick up my pen. Thank you and good night.